We're getting into um, human ecology and the environment. We're going to try to build on a lot of the concepts we've developed over this series. And we'll talk about human population growth, our own species as a population, and um, as comprised of a certain number of individuals that change in numbers through time. We can be modeled in the same way we've been modeling other species, and we'll look at that. We'll talk about the demographic transition that countries undergo during their development, and discuss the demographic transition in the, in the context of explosive population growth. We'll have a good time talking about a whole range of environmental calamities. Um, we'll just only be able to pick a few of our favorites to focus on for lack of time, but we'll focus on some of the critical ones that um, we should be introduced to in order to form a, an intelligent opinion of our own when we're confronted by these subjects in society at large, including global climate change. And um, hopefully I can, I don't know if I'll get there, but we may introduce conservation biology today, a field that many of you I know are involved in and interested in becoming involved in. Human population growth has been steeper than exponential over these past 500 years. The dynamics in the very recent years are changing. But over, over these last hundreds of years, apparently it's been steeper than exponential. This is basically unprecedented for a big um, vertebrate. There are, there are no other documented cases like this that, that I'm aware of um, for such an extended period of time. It's been quite a, an extraordinary story. There are blips along the way. Um, yeah, blips registering on this curve in the form of things like the bubonic plague, which wiped out a huge percentage of Europeans and many other people around the world before it even got to Europe. This was a disease, um, it's bacterial, right? Bubonic plague, transmitted through the skin um, and fleas were a big part of it. So um, this was a huge event that registers, but very few other event events are registered on a graph at this scale. Um, the world wars um, of last century barely register. The various fantastic flu in uh, influenza Influences they don't register. So, you know, the human population growth has, has had an incredible engine behind it that um, has been virtually unstoppable. You can, um, in recent years, you can see a, a more detailed graph there. And you can go today to um, various websites. Here's one and check population numbers day by day. Now, these are, um, these are estimates, of course. Um, they're apparently not that bad as estimates uh, go of population numbers. And so as of last night, when I checked, um, you had some 314 million people uh, in the United States and over 7 billion in the world. Seven, we hit 7 billion um, this time last year. And you can see that... Uh, this doubling time has been spectacular in recent years. We were at a billion, I'm not sure the exact date, but not too long ago, and now we're up at seven billion. You know, this diagram from your textbook from 2008 um, doesn't show us yet at that point. Quite incredible. One of the um, primary generators of these, of these new individuals in human populations occurs during a demographic transition in the development of countries. Now we're stuck talking about um, developed and, and developing countries as a, as a terminology. It's preferable in my mind to certain other terminologies for describing that, but it's inadequate. But we, we're referring to something, something primarily about technological development when we say a developed country as opposed to a developing country. <clears throat> and when countries have been looked at historically and examined historically in terms of their population numbers, they're seen to go through a characteristic transition, the demographic transition, from a period of high birth rates and high death rates to a period of low birth rates and low death rates. But the kicker comes in that transition period when death rates go down steeply before birth rates start to go down. And when you have death rates plummeting without birth rates changing, you, that's a recipe for explosion in numbers. And the duration of that transition, the length of the transition, uh, how prolonged it is, uh, influences just how many numbers are added during that transition. So this is an example from Sweden here, which is seen to undergo that developmental period prior to um, 1900, prior to it occurring in Mexico. Data from Mexico showing birth rate here and death rate steeply declining without birth rate changing for many years before birth rate started to chase it downward like that. Now, what causes the death rate to plum plummet in a uh, society like these? Abiotic factors. Um, how, how do those come into play? Diseases can wipe out entire communities and then they stop being as effective at wiping out entire communities. How? Developing immunities. So I think you started by saying an abiotic factor. I would see that as more of a biotic factor. If you, if you were thinking in terms of diseases influencing the population and then the population developing immunity, in that sense, evolving to handle the disease, I would see that as more of a biological reaction, a biotic change. Um, I'm not sure how much evidence there is for that. That would have been undergoing, that would have been occurring in, that occurs in all populations and would have presumably occurred prior to any um, point in the history of the development of the country. But I may not be thinking that through fully. What else? My play role, yes. Political strife. So how would political strife influence this declining death rate? War, influencing a decline in the death rate. Opposite. So if there's less war than in the developing country, that could influence it. I'm not sure if that evidence is there. There's been some interesting research recently on um, violence and brutality and slavery and you know, all these phenomena of humanity. And an influential psychologist has been looking at the data and suggesting that the number of wars and the, the brutality index is actually on the decline globally when you look at what, just what was happening in the past. But that's, that's debatable, whether, um, whether wars, the decline of war, warring could, could influence this effort. Yes? Advancement in medical technology. That's probably a big one. Simple advancement in sanitation, sanitary conditions also in hospitals, in medical um, you know, medical environments. That's probably a really big one. Advances agriculturally, um, the ability to provide more resources in terms of food to a growing population probably plays a role. Those are the big ones. Um, and that happens before any changes associated with birth rate. We'll unpack that a little more as we go. At a glance, you can look at an age structure pyramid for a country, three different countries here. And you can look at the shape of an age structure pyramid and get an idea for how that country is or is not changing in numbers. 
this is uh, the percent of the population broken into male and female at different age categories. And you know, the reproductive ages will be a certain portion of this pyramid. The lowest levels will be the non-reproductive ages. A bottom heavy, well, a pyramid, a bottom heavy uh, distribution like this signals a rapid growth ensuing in the, in the near future. Because all of these individuals, there are so many individuals in these categories that haven't yet reached reproductive age that you, pre you predict an explosion of growth in a society like that. A more even distribution like this, for example, in the United States, suggests a slower growth. Because these individuals where you have your bulge, you have your so many numbers, are entering post-reproductive, uh, a post-reproductive period where they won't be contributing any more numbers. And the bulge here is your, uh, your baby boom, right, from post-World War II. Or in many countries, and this is happening in many developed countries, many European countries, many Western European countries have a bulge, um, which is a sort of a bulge around the middle. And this can be correlated with, um, with no growth or even declines in numbers, a phenomenon that wasn't exactly predicted during the late 60s, early 70s, when the population explosion came to the minds of intellectuals um, around the world with the, uh, the dire forecasts about what population would do, m most of which have been upheld as we hit 7 billion last year. But many of the declines, these periods of, of decline, weren't exactly predicted as uh, going to occur in, by 2010. And so that, you need to factor that in in your thoughts about future population growth, the rapidity with which countries can or cannot reach this type of distribution. And then you get into additional problems associated with the slowing or the reduction in growth, which now countries are struggling with. Japan, Italy, these places are struggling with, well, how are we going to have enough people in our country to, for one thing, service these people when they're elderly and to finance their, um, their, their lives when they're old. So you get, in, you get into a whole set of new problems when populations start to radically decline in numbers. So breaking things down a little further, we can look at um, changes in human birth rate by different regions. So for the world as a whole, the average number of children per female in the late 60s was still up around five per female, five kids per female around the world. It's dropped a lot to today's levels, um, somewhere under three. But that's for the world as a whole, and different parts of the world are seen to have responded differently. There's declines everywhere, you know, in all these regions, basically. But in Africa, where numbers started at almost seven kids per female, it's still well over four. In Asia, the decline being steeper in Latin America, and then the so-called developed countries, um, some of them falling below replacement levels. Now, replacement levels are the number of offspring needed to keep the population stable in numbers. And if, if you have two parents, and um, how many kids does it take to be at replacement level on average? It's above two, because kids die uh, and don't make it to reproductive age. So it's somewhere above two, and how, the, how much mortality there is in a society for those younger ages influences that replacement level. It's also influenced by the fact that there are more boys than girls born on average, typically. There's something like 1.06 boys born for every one girl in the United States. And we don't need to get into details as to why. I'm not sure it's entirely fully understood why, but that's the case. But then it balances later. And among older ages, there are actually more females than males because of the different mortality schedules for males and females. But that plays into the replacement weight rate as well, the differential in number of males and females at birth, but more importantly, mortality factors. So something around 2.1 is the replacement rate in the United States. Um, and so that's sometimes what you hear, you know, the average, you know, to, to meet replacement, you should have something like, if you're interested in maintaining replacement, have 2.1 kids or something like that. And that's a good trick if you can work that out. Um, in the United States, there's a birth every eight seconds and a death every 13 seconds on average. That alone would suggest um, growth in numbers, would it? Not necessarily because of this replacement rate being um, what it is. But what's another major factor that influences population numbers in the United States? Because the United States is, is growing rapidly. It's still growing, even though it's basically at replacement level. Here's by country here, the USA, average number of children per female in 1970, and in 2006, it was about 2.1. It's about replacement. But why is the country growing? Still so in numbers? Hmm? Yes, immigration. We can't forget about immigration and emigration. There is a net of one new individual added through immigration every 46 seconds, according to the data on my phone here. You can check it yourself, but I don't think that's too far off. So one individual added net every 46 seconds through immigration. And many are lost to emigration, but there's a net gain. That produces a net gain of one person every 14 seconds, all told, according to these numbers. Don't, don't take them as uh, sacrosanct. They're just uh, to give you an idea of what's happening. Also, one thing I, um, I noted here, just to, because it's hard to conceive of these very big numbers, these billions. We don't have a good handle on what is a billion. And so a couple ways to think about billions that uh, have, have proven effective in the past is in terms of money, or in terms of um, a good way to think about it is in terms of walking. If you took a billion steps, if you walked a billion steps, at like two feet a step, you could walk to the moon and almost back home. That's a billion. That's a lot. That's far. <laughs> to be able to walk to the moon and almost back with just a billion steps, only a billion steps. Well, there's seven billion people. Or if you spent $10,000 a day, which would be a big day, you could spend $10,000 a day for 270 years and you'd get to a billion bucks. I mean, so a billion is a huge number. So when we're talking about seven billion living, breathing, eating, crapping human individuals, we're talking about a whole lot of activity. I hope you recognize that. Looking country by country at the world over, in terms of numbers of individuals, number of children per female, you can see just how different it is across the world. Um, under two children in these, in these blues for much of this area, and getting hotter in this area, where you have five, to, all the way up to eight um, children in some of these countries born per female individual. What is a reality in this process is a correlation between indicators of wealth in a society and fertility rate. GDP being a very a simple um, and flawed indicator of a country's wealth correlates well with fertility rate when you go country by country like this. GDP doesn't tend to factor in environmental damage caused by the population locally, which is one of the reasons why it's so flawed. When you look at a country's wealth, well, 
what is the impact that those individuals in that country are having on their own ecosystem. That doesn't tend to play into these models. Economists are getting much more sensitive to that, to the services that ecosystems provide, and factoring those into, model, into their models, but that's not done traditionally. But anyway, you slice it, really, you see this, these sorts of um, correlations. And there's the world with an average GDP estimated there. Here's your, here's your global average replacement rate at 2.33, well above the United States' replacement rate as a result of different mortality trends in different countries. And you see some countries fall off the, off the curve as apparent anomalies, Saudi Arabia, Israel, and the US falling somewhat north of this curve. Anyone want to speculate why for those three in particular, that they might show higher fertility rates than predicted based on their GDP? Anyone want to have a try at that? Sure. Yeah, more conservative and not involved as, with as much birth control. That's what some people suggest, yeah. The role of religion being very prominent in such societies, and um, you can look it up. I, I think it's interesting, but um, that is generally a favored interpretation. This is an interesting connection if you want to play with it. And you can look at some formal academic studies on this subject. The role of television, societally, in influencing birth rates, and particularly soap operas. You, anywhere you travel, if you travel anywhere in the developing world, one thing you find very consistently is that the world loves soap operas. Soap operas are a hit wherever you go, um, across economic strata, yeah? Uh, everyone loves a good soap. What's one thing you never see in soap operas? You may hear them, but you never see them. What? Babies, yes. They, you may hear them crying in a room behind a closed door or something. But classically, babies are not part of the drama that is a soap opera. Those are adult dramas with adult problems and um, a, the adult condition. And as soaps have entered homes, apparently it's influenced the dynamics of the home and the family structure. I don't know if there's anything to it, but there's been a fair number of research by, um, by quite intelligent folks on this. And when they speak of the end of the soap opera era, which they've spoken of in the last couple of years, I, I perked up because you know all these soaps, uh, all these soaps were canceled in the last few years, as you may know or may not know. I don't even have cable TV, so I don't know really these dynamics except through the headlines. But apparently the soaps are just fading out of prominence in the United States. And I'm sure these scholars are interested in that phenomenon in relation to these changing birth rates. Oh, actually, pretty interesting. You can click them if you want to know about them. Don't worry about those relationships between TV and fertility rate for the exam. Another um, point of interest here related to the last couple of years is a, is a connection, and these data haven't been fully vetted because uh, it's so new, but a link between fertility and the recent recession. The so-called Great Recession that we just went through, that I think officially ended in 2009, right? Officially speaking. Well, birth rates, and here you have fertility rate show this strong decline starting in 2008, maintained through the recession, and with a changing trend maybe in 2011, last year, in a, in a rebound in fertility rates. This is in the United States. So if you want to link economics and these factors locally, you can see those links in a, in a dynamic like that. Here's um, changes in unemployment rate by state and fertility rate by state, showing a negative correlation between unemployment and fertility. And this you can get into, uh, if you want, about first moms having their first kid or second kid or third kid. Basically, fewer moms are having first and second children, but those that already have two um, are more likely to have another one then. A new mom is likely to start a family during this recession. So that's sort of backwards, according to what Malthus predicted. Because the wealthier your society, the more resources supposedly available, right? So shouldn't that trigger increases in birth rate? What is the connection here between wealth, by whatever index we're using, societally, and uh, fertility? Why does fertility seem to go down um, in the first case with wealth? Why this connection, firstly? Yes? Increased education is apparently a big one, because these wealthier societies with these more developed education systems are also including women in the process. Um, not only are the education systems uh, better developed in general, but there's more inclusion of women. And then a greater role for women as better educated individuals in the relatively better educated individuals in those societies for professional roles in the society. So they're not just individuals that are supposed to stay at home and make the house. They have a professional role to play. And that can be, uh, that's probably a big factor here. There may be others. I'll let you, I'll let you think about them. How about in a, in a local recession like this? These, you can see these quick declines. So in our community where GDP is relatively high, in a recession, you see the more expected relationship. And that's really interesting, too, when you think about the reverse condition. You know, these, these women who are not reading in the way that they had been in a previous, uh, in a previous time, it's not like they're less educated all of a sudden. Uh, no, it's not the case of that at all. It's probably coming down to the strict local economics and the psychological factors associated with these, uh, these economically difficult times. Again, something you're welcome to think more about. What is the Earth's carrying capacity? We don't know is the bottom line. Just, you know, and I had this question during the semester from some of you with carrying capacity. Carrying capacity is not something out there in a population waiting to be discovered or in an environment. It's not like that number exists somewhere for a population that's carrying capacity. We model population dynamics and can estimate carrying capacity from those models. But it's not like there's a, a fixed K to be um, estimated. Not to mention the fact that K differs across space and time, so it's dynamic, and you can never um, put your finger on it for very long before it... Before